Welcome to our second lecture covering Chapter 10. As you know, the name of this chapter is Your Responsibilities as a Hospitality Operator to Guests. Apologize for that. Let's resume. During our first lecture, we talked about this first topic, which is accommodating guests. So we're going to now move on and start talking about the topic of guest privacy and likely cover other topics in this particular lecture. So let's begin. I'm going to fast forward to guest privacy. Um, we've all been in a hotel at some point in our lives and we have all expected that our privacy would be honored. Um, that uh, people from the hotel would not come into our room except to clean it and when we um, uh, want them to be in it perhaps if we were having say room service or we had some kind of a situation in the room where we needed assistance maybe the television wasn't working or there was a leak in the in the bathroom or something along those lines we do have that expectation of privacy um, especially in the hotel context and we want to and our as as hotel, hospitality operators we want to honor that request and to uh, excessively interfere with a guest's use of his or her room um, is uh, not in uh, not consistent with uh, the role of an innkeeper the innkeeper does have the right to enter the room. Um, a, an example of when the innkeeper does have the right to enter would be in the situation where the guest has overstayed his or her um, a period that he or she has um, arranged to stay in that particular uh, hotel room. Uh, there could be other reasons that a that an innkeeper may need to go in. For example, um, if there are um, indications that there is um, a fire or fumes or a property damage inside. Um, also, an innkeeper um, uh, has the expectation that he or she will maintain the room. Now, um, in many cases, the, the hotel um, guest would, could put up a sign indicating they don't want housekeeping, uh, but the default expectation is that housekeeping will be provided um, at least in the transient guest situation on a daily basis. Um, sometimes law enforcement may approach an innkeeper and say, we would like to gain access to that hotel room. It might be a situation where the um, uh, police think that there is some kind of a criminal activity they're going on in, in that hotel room. For example, a prostitution or, um, uh, well, recently in, in the Las Vegas situation where the gunman was, um, uh, op was shooting people from a hotel room, that would be obviously another extreme situation um, uh, where there might be some uh, criminal activity actually occurring in the room. But it could also be a situation in which there's no uh, evidence of criminal activity now, but the police might think that there could be evidence that's relevant to some kind of criminal inquiry. For example, uh, a white collar crime. It might be that there's some uh, paperwork that would point to some kind of embezzlement that the particular hotel guest might have um, in his suitcase or something along those lines, even though he's not embezzling at this particular moment. In those situations, you're going to want to ask for the search warrant. You're going to want to assert the interests of the guest um, and make sure that the police uh, officer has the correct paperwork uh, before you g allow him to gain entrance to the hotel room. Um, if he has that correct paperwork, then you are required to allow him to have access for his search purposes. Sometimes uh, law enforcement may want to um, uh, view guest records. Um, these uh, can arise um, in lots of different circumstances. For example, um, the uh, police uh, or the law enforcement personnel may want to see whether this person was in this town on that particular date. Well, a record of, of um, uh, hotel use or restaurant use on a particular day would point to the fact that this person was, was located at this particular place. Uh, the police may also want to uh, see what what calls were called from the hotel room, um, things along those lines. And again, you'll want to follow the legal requirements before you give up that information to the law enforcement officials. Sometimes you'll get requests from other guests or um, 
just uh, strangers who are seeking information and under those circumstances you should not give out that information there could be situations of stalking or domestic violence or just um, a, a domestic dispute type situation where giving that information could put people in jeopardy or and and or could result in the guest not being happy with the um, hospitality operator giving up that information so best practice is just not to give up that information except to law enforcement and uh, following the rules both of search warrants and of the USA Patriot Act and again and there's information about the USA Patriot Act uh, near the end of chapter 10 that's a good reference for more specifics let's consider a few particular areas of um, um, ho actually let me just check off this topic that we've covered now that was a quick quick one we're going to talk about uh, facility maintenance next so that's our next item on our list Oops, went too far, sorry about that. Um, so we're gonna talk about some areas of a hotel that are especially prone to liability issues. And I think these probably are pretty obvious why they are greater concerns. Um, a swimming pool, obviously, there's the risk of drowning. Um, there's the risk of if someone dives of, of uh, neck and head injuries. Um, if it's a spa, uh, uh, well, obviously if it's a jacuzzi type spa, then people can overheat and pass out. Um, if it is a spa that does massages and things like that, um, then obviously there can be uh, concerns about the products that are applied, uh, the use of, of force um, in the massage or other things, and there is, it can be uh, concerns about um, uh, 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 sexual uh, assault or sexual harassment or things along those lines as well because many times those involve rather personal uh, procedures and sometimes people are not fully clothed when these procedures are going on. Also, uh, workout areas are an area that present certain challenges. Uh, machinery can malfunction. People can be using equipment that really there should be spotters involved with, but if there aren't spotters, the person can be at, at risk. A person can use this equipment unsafely. Um, or a person can be using it appropriately, but they um, have a heart attack or something like that. Now, you may recall um, the... Um, uh, CFO of uh, Facebook, her husband, while they were on, I think, vacation, um, I guess had a heart attack or some event like that while he was on a treadmill and he passed away in a hotel. Uh, events like that can happen. And of course, in most cases, it's not going to result in any liability, but it's possible that uh, depending upon the circumstances, um, a poorly designed workout area could present some issues. For example, let's say um, behind a, a treadmill was a, a, a glass, uh, a pane of glass. And so if somebody trips, and is kind of pushed off the, the treadmill in the back and they land on the glass and the glass shatters, they could be uh, badly badly cut up and caught cut up. And in those circumstances, that would be a poorly designed work, workout area. So you'll wanna consider things like, is this equipment appropriate? Um, what age does it become appropriate for people to use this equipment? Um, are some is some of the equipment the type that requires um, a training to use or that require spotters and, and those circumstances those types of, of equipment probably aren't appropriate you'll probably want to have some kind of a key access uh, for a few reasons one is so that um, you don't have people kind of wandering into your facility to use this equipment but also so that it doesn't become overwhelmed with with use which can create additional safety issues and and finally you want to make this be a perk for your facility um, you can also use this perhaps to limit the access that children might have to the facility at least uh, the, the parents would know if the children were venturing into these particular areas. So these concerns or these particular places in the hotel uh, raise particular concerns along these lines, but these concerns can appear in other parts of the uh, hotel. We can be concerned about slip and fall situations. A slip and fall is a, a term from tort law that you'll hear oftentimes in the law. And this is when somebody slips. Usually it's on maybe some water or particularly um, a slick surface and they fall and they are injured. 
Um, and so when you're uh, considering things like uh, the pool, you'll want to have some kind of um, tile around the pool that is not going to um, lend itself to that type of slippage. And you won't want to have, say, uh, marble steps next to the pool where people with wet feet can be especially prone to sliding or, or things along those lines. Um, you'll want to make sure when you're mopping up spills or your, your staff is mopping up spills that they put up a signs indicating that this particular area is wet. And again, this applies especially to these particular areas in the, in the hotel, but would really apply to any area within the hotel. Obviously, drowning and diving injuries are especially a concern in the swimming pool scenario. Um, and you, so therefore, you'll want to make sure that you're complying with all of the rules in that particular locality about public pools. What signs need to be posted? You're probably going to need a sign that says, you know, lifeguard is not on duty. Now, you may think to yourself, well, that's kind of silly. It's obvious there's no lifeguard on duty. Uh, you're right. It does seem rather silly to put that kind of notice up, but it is required and you do need to have it. Um, when you're building, of course, the pool, you're going to want to make sure that the requirements for the the depth and the, the signage for the pool are appropriate. If those rules happen to change and older pools are not grandfathered, you want to make sure that you're updating those rules. Um, the, uh, the, the safety of, of the swimming pool area and other areas in the facility would want to be, you'd want that to be on your checklist of places that are routinely checked to make sure that um, uh, the, the, the facility is being maintained appropriately. As always, you want to make sure you're complying with all the state, local, and federal laws with respect to safety. Uh, this would obviously include escalators, elevators, um, smoke detectors, um, carbon monoxide detectors if those are uh, required in your area, uh, fire extinguishers, all of those things need to be checked periodically and according to the regulations. You also want to make sure that you have enough of them and they're in the right locations and that they are uh, displayed in the right, the right method. A couple of issues that have come up in more recent years is the issue of bed bugs. Um, bed bugs have made us a comeback, unfortunately, um, and in certain parts of the country, they can be very common in the hotel situation. And they are a very, very difficult problem for hotels. Um, you have one guest come in who has some level of, of infestation, perhaps in, in his uh, clothes or on his person or in his suitcase, and he can infest the room. And then once it's infested, it may be very, very difficult to get rid of an infestation. The next guest who comes in then becomes infected, infested with this item. And so he or she, when he goes to the next place, may, may uh, uh, spread that further. Um, bed bugs are very difficult, very easy to spread, but very difficult to get rid of and are very, very unpleasant. Um, there can lead to, to bad bites and, and uh, all kinds of problems, and so they are not to be treated lightheartedly. Um, it's a good idea, especially if that is a problem in your particular market, uh, to do very careful checks of beds from time to time, training your housekeeping staff how to approach those, looking both um, um, underneath the mattresses, on top of the mattresses, underneath the mattress covers, and in all other places where they can hide. And of course, if you have an infestation, uh, you'll want to address it aggressively and you won't, won't want to uh, rent this room until um, you feel confident that your guests will not be inconvenienced by that type of problem. Defibrillators um, can be required in certain uh, businesses, um, depending upon the state and local rules. So you'll want to make sure that you're in compliance. The EADs are pretty common nowadays. These are automated devices that allow people to uh, defibrillate people whose, whose heart has stopped. And so it can, can really be a lifesaver in that type of crisis situation. They're relatively easy to use, but if you choose to have them in your facility, you definitely will want to train your workers um, about how they should be operated. Um, and you'll want to make sure that if you aren't using them, that you don't have to have them available to your, uh, your staff. Um, and if, again, if you either choose to have them or require to have them, that you make sure you're complying with all the rules about the training that's required, that you have them in the right locations um, according to whatever the particular rules are in your location. Let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. We've already talked about the Americans with Disabilities Act in an earlier chapter. We were talking about them from the position of um, 
employees. Um, I think maybe we've moved on to a different topic. Here we go. Wait a second. Here we go. Uh, I guess we're still talking about, yeah, we're still talking about uh, uh, facility maintenance. I'm sorry. Uh, so, and, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, we talked about before from the context of the employee. We talked about the duty to reasonably accommodate the employee's disability. Well, we also have responsibilities to guests in our facility, uh, both guests in the hotel context and also guests in the restaurant and bar scenarios. And so we're going to talk about uh, the big categories that we need to do in those circumstances. And there's, there's four of them that we're focusing on. One is that we have to be able to get the individuals into our facility. So, you know, it, and there's lots of different ways that disabled people can arrive, just like able-bodied people can arrive. Um, we need to make sure there's parking spaces uh, appropriate for them, and those are designated and in the places that they're required to be. Um, it's a good practice to have uh, parking spaces that allow for um, exit of wheelchairs and disabled individuals. You're very likely to need uh, wheelchair ramps uh, so that people in wheelchairs can uh, safely and easily gain access to the building. Uh, doors may need to be a certain width so that the wheelchair can accommodate that, that uh, space. You want to make sure that your bathrooms are accessible. Uh, many times uh, uh, one particular stall will be devoted to um, handicap usage and so you want to make sure that that's available and that it meets the requirements of the ADA for individuals in those circumstances. These are just a few of the requirements. Uh, there can be many, many others. And we'll talk in a little bit later about how you ought to approach looking at these issues. Um, this last one has been a subject of a fair amount of discussion uh, recently. This, this has come up in the movie theater uh, scenario where there's been some discussion about the need to provide um, interpreters perhaps for people seeing movies, maybe people who are um, deaf uh, seeing movies. Um, and and there, there is some precedent for needing to provide uh, some level of assistance in accessing the services. Uh, so, for example, if I'm deaf and there's a performance um, and yet my seat is too far that I can't lip read or perhaps I don't happen to be a lip reading deaf person, um, for me to enjoy and experience whatever it is, I may need an interpreter. And some courts have required that um, public accommodations actually provide interpreters. They're not foreign language interpreters because, of course, the inability to speak or understand English uh, when one can speak or understand a different language, different spoken language, isn't a disability. A disability would be if I can't understand English because I can't hear, for example. That would be a disability. Um, there can also be requirements perhaps for closed captioning or um, headsets that would allow me to hear the, uh, the information better or to describe perhaps what is being seen on the screen and then perhaps materials might need to be provided in braille, um, uh, exit signs, uh, things along those lines. Number three might be that we might need to modify some policies uh, that might tend to have a discriminatory effect. For example, in your restaurant, you're probably not going to want animals to be present. In fact, there probably are going to be um, uh, city codes that prohibit animals from being in restaurant areas. But if a person has a service am animal and they have the service animal because of a disability, then you have to modify your policy to allow that service animal to be present. Um, that would be an example of an accommodation um, that would be appropriate under those circumstances. Um, then you want to make sure that you aren't using criteria for eligibility that limits a particular population. For example, if I'm deaf, I'm not going to have a driver's license. And so if you say, well, you've got to have a driver's license to do X, Y, and Z, I might be able to perfectly well do X, Y, and Z, even though I'm blind, but I'm not going to be able to have that driver's license. And so you would need to be able to provide a different type of credential that would allow me to participate. Maybe it's my passport or some other, uh, most states have some type of uh, photo ID uh, for non-drivers, and that would be a good, good mechanism for me to be able to uh, use whatever that particular service might be. 
So let's look at uh, some physical barrier issues that are probably the most troubling, the most challenging for businesses to confront. Now, I'll be honest with you, if you're dealing with a new facility, the architect and the contractor will have addressed most of these issues from the get-go. So there won't be as much that you need to do on a day-in, day-out basis. If you are dealing with an older facility, especially an historical facility, then there may well be more that you need to do. There will be some aspects that will be grandfathered and you won't have to make all the changes, but as you um, renovate the, the facility, uh, the act of renovation means that many times you have to bring whatever that particular thing is up to the ADA requirements. So let's consider some of the particular issues that come up. One is you obviously need to have an, an accessible approach and entrance, some way that people who are perhaps in a wheelchair or use a cane or have some other mobility issue can get to your facility and also enter the facility. The second one can be challenging even if the building itself is okay. This can be um, when there's a limited access to goods and services. Um, this comes up, for example, if you were to have a retail portion of your business. Let's say you're running a Rainforest Cafe and you, or a, a Cracker Barrel where you have some location, well, some part of your business where you're selling items. Well, even though the facility might be perfectly safe, if you have narrow aisles, that wheelchair user may not find it possible to maneuver and to go down all the aisles. That is an FM, I'm assuming an ADA violation. So you want to make sure that you have those, those uh, wide aisles. This also can present uh, fire hazards. And so that's another reason to be concerned about that. Uh, because we're talking about um, movable fixtures, or oh, that's kind of a uh, oxymoron, movable displays, um, you need to stay with your staff and make sure that they understand that um, more isn't always more, sometimes more is less, that we need to maybe display less um, in order to satisfy the requirements, and that may require that you continue to remind folks about this. Obviously, access to restrooms is an important part of this. Uh, raise a just brief question or brief issue about transgender people. This is a very controversial topic and um, obviously our role here is not to present a particular perspective on this, but generally speaking, uh, transgender um, individuals, um, to, at least to this point, have not been found to be covered by the Americans Disabilities Act because they have not been found to have a disability. Um, that may change, uh, but at this point, um, uh, the transgender access to a particular restroom facility is not an ADA issue, but there may be local laws um, and eventually state laws that impact this particular topic. And so it's a good idea to keep track of this. Uh, many facilities in order to best serve their uh, guests have unisex facilities in addition to gender specific facilities. Sometimes these facilities are single occupancy or they are family facilities. And that can be a good way of being able to manage uh, a controversial and somewhat um, a stressful situation if you have the ability to direct um, individuals who are uncomfortable with the way a particular bathroom situation is working out uh, to a place that may be more able to satisfy their expectations. Then of course there's all the other parts of the facility. Um, I once was on a cruise and uh, we received uh, uh, or we, we got a handicap accessible a cabin and it was lovely. It was larger uh, simply because it had to accommodate a wheelchair um, and the, uh, the, the bathroom area was significantly larger and so it was kind of interesting how that worked out. I was not traveling with a disabled person so we did not need the facility. I guess a disabled person uh, did not find that they needed it but um, uh, there, there, these, these issues can come up in lots of different places. Certainly hotel rooms, you would need to have some that are um, uh, maneuverable for somebody who is mobility impaired. Um, you'd also need in your restaurant to not have your table so closely together the disabled person uh, can't maneuver around the, the facility as they might need to go to the bathroom or to make it to their table or things along those lines. 
So let's talk about how you might approach making an evaluation of your facility. And you're going to want to do this periodically. Certainly you'll want to do this um, at the time that you're considering renovations, but you'll want to do it periodically otherwise. One is, you, I guess the first step is just to plan what your, the scope of what you're going to do is. Um, are you looking at a particular restaurant in your facility? Or are you considering a particular type of room in your hotel? Um, or you're considering the, the reception area in your hotel. You'll want to think through the scope of what you're looking at and, and what's your plan for how to approach it. You're going to want to get the floor plan and, and um, how you are currently displaying uh, movable items in your area, the sofas, the, the tables, the chairs, um, all those items. You'll also want to look for things like steps and, and, and areas that slope and things along those lines. Then obviously once you develop your plan of what you're going to do, you need to start doing it. And this is going to involve measurement. You're going to be measuring, hey, how wide is this aisle? Um, and, and write down that, that amount. You want to document not only the statistics that you're developing, but also that you did go through these steps because this is a, a compliance issue. Um, and so you want to be able to document that you did these measurements on this particular day under these particular circumstances. And these are the results that you found. So you want to be precise and methodical as you do this type of work. Then you'll want to make recommendations. So you will have identified most likely some challenges, some areas that you'll want to improve, and you'll want to come up with a budget for how you're going to pay for the changes that you might make. Obviously, in many cases, it'll be simple. You'll just move that table a little bit. Well, there's no budget needed for that, or you'll move that um, that display a little bit over. Again, no budget needed for that, but if you have steps down to an area where that's not accessible for somebody in a wheelchair, you'd want to then consider, well, how will, how will we uh, address, adjust this so that the wheelchair user can get access to that particular area? And so you'll need to consider um, how you might uh, contract that out to meet that, those particular needs. You'll plan for the improvements, you'll get bids, you'll hire the right company to do it, you'll have a timeline for when things will be completed, you'll have uh, monitoring to make sure the improvements are along the lines that would bring you into full compliance with the ADA. And as always, you'll document your efforts. Yes, we're making these changes uh, to comply with the law and to meet our customers, our consumers, our, our guests' needs. But we're also doing this because we are required to document it. And this is going to be an important set of evidence. So you want to do it, all these things, but you also want to do it in a way that you can have a record that you did it. And so that's an important part of the equation in the contemporaneous record. Okay, so now we're going to flip for a second or talk about our next topic. We've talked about, oops, went too far. We've talked about facility maintenance. Now we're going to talk about what are our responsibilities to non-guests. We've talked about our duties to guests, but let's talk about what we need to do when somebody who isn't a guest is involved. Well, here we go. Okay, so we have three categories that we're going to be looking at. One is going to be guests of guests. And here, of course, we're using guest in the way that we ordinarily use that word. Um, friend, somebody who is not paying for the service, but the, 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 the guest, as we are using the term, is paying for their guest service. So it's a little bit confusing. We're actually using guests in two different ways. Um, imagine that Bob is the one who is actually paying for the hotel room, and he's the one who's checked in. But he's there with his wife, Sally, and their three children, Mary, Harry, and Larry. Or it could be um, that Teresa is uh, treating her mom to dinner at the restaurant. Well, the mom would be a guest of Teresa, the guest. Generally speaking, the guest of the guest is entitled to the same protections that the guest is. And we'll talk about uh, what, 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 that universe in a couple of minutes. There are in some jurisdictions a few tweaks to the obligations that the hospitality operator has towards guests of guests. But a good rule of thumb on operating uh, perspective ought to be that the hospitality operator should treat guests of guests the same way that he or she would treat guests. 
Um, if a matter results in litigation, your attorney might choose to uh, make some distinctions, but it's too complicated for you in the trenches to make those distinctions or understand those very subtle shades of meaning that might be different. Plus, in many cases, you won't know who the guest is and who the guest of the guest is. And so you don't want to get into a position of, of uh, making the wrong call in that area. We'll talk about invitees in a, in a second, but as you can see here, I've already kind of given away the game. Guests are a category of invitees. So let's move ahead and talk about trespassers. A trespasser, and, and for what, whatever reason, our textbook did not define trespasser, so this is kind of an informal definition. It's someone who is present without the permission of the a landowner or land possessor. Um, this could be somebody who, uh, uh, is a burglar, for example, or somebody who has been told to leave and who has chosen not to leave. Um, because our places are public accommodation, the default setting when people are in our facility is that they are invitees because we're open to the public and somebody from the public comes in. I mean, we think it's a good thing. Maybe they're going to rent a room. Maybe they're going to buy a drink. Maybe they're going to order some food. This is a positive thing. We want them in our business. Uh, but sometimes we, we, we conclude that this person isn't there for a reason that we approve of. And so then we might say, we don't need you here anymore. And then they become a trespasser. Okay. One thing that we want to make a distinction is between a wandering guest and a trespasser. So a wandering guest is somebody who is a legitimate guest. And again, the, the, the first meaning here, uh, the, the, the person who's paying. And th but this person has gone into an area of the facility that guests aren't supposed to go into. Maybe they went through a door saying employees only. Um, or management or something like that. So that they're in an area they're not supposed to be in, but they're supposed to be in the, in the restaurant or they're supposed to be in the hotel. So they aren't, in some sense, they're trespassing right now at this very moment, but they aren't trespassing entirely. They should be here. They just should be in this particular part of here. And we call that person a wandering guest. Generally speaking, we owe that wandering guest um, the, the same types of protections that we would want to have for our invitees. Maybe a little bit less, but you know, generally speaking, we're, we're more in the invitee territory with the wandering guest. But a true trespasser is different. There is generally no duty to warn a trespasser. So let's say we happen to have a, a leak and there's a big puddle that's developed. We'd have to let the, the invitees, including guests, know about the puddle uh, so they could avoid it and not slip and fall. We'd also need to let the guests of guests know about that. But we wouldn't have to put up a sign after our, our restaurant is closed and locked up just in the event that the burglar comes into our facility and we, we, you know, we're not so concerned about whether he trips or not. And so we don't have a duty to warn a trespasser um, about dangerous conditions. And we don't have a duty to maintain the facility so that the trespasser is going to be safe. Um, but there is some level of duty that we do owe to a trespasser. And that is we, we can't set up booby traps. We can't set up uh, situations that uh, the trespasser will be injured if he does this or that or the other. Um, the, uh, now we could set up booby traps as in, in terms of alarms or things like that, but we can't set up, you know, say a gun that would go off if the, the, the trespasser crosses a particular string or something like that. But we don't want to do that for two reasons. Number one, the law wants us to preserve life, and so we shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, there shouldn't be the death sentence for trespassing. But also, um, we don't want to do it because guess what? It could be a firefighter or a police officer coming in or a, a wandering guest could come in or an employee who's responding to an alarm call or something like that. So booby traps don't always catch the, the booby, the, the trespasser. They might capture the person who should be there who just didn't know about the trap. So for those reasons, booby traps are a really, 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 really bad idea. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this middle category, the invitees. You can see that we had the EE -E ending, which means that this person received the invite or invitation. We've called the person extending the invitation the invitor. In this case, that's you, the hospitality operator. You have invited this person, and they are here in response to your invitation. So here's the definition from the textbook. An individual who is on a property at the expressed or implied consent of the owner. 
And that, of course, would be you, the owner or possessor of the property, you, the hospitality um, operator. So what are the obligations that we owe to the invitee? Well, we really have three. We have to take reasonable care of our facility so it's safe. We can't have gaping holes in the floor or things like that. Uh, we have the duty to warn of potential dangers. It's not possible to you know, snap our fingers and immediately fix that leaking roof or um, other things. So sometimes what we do is we put up a sign saying, hey, be careful, we're, we're going to fix this, but we can't fix it instantaneously. So be sure not to wander into this area, either putting up barricades or putting up warning signs. And then, of course, we have the responsibility to promptly fix any dangers that we do become aware of. It's the stuff that we expect that we're going to have. Remember, we were talking about slip and falls before. This is why we need uh, to. This is why we need to be concerned about slip and falls. When we fail to accomplish these levels of protections for our invitees, we invite those types of lawsuits. So, who are invitees? Who do we owe these duties to? Well, here are some examples, and this is not a complete list. The guests, the the remember we we, we defined guests earlier on in this presentation. People who are paying for the use of a facility, be it a restaurant or a bar or a hotel room. Also, um, we're talking about our employees. After all, we want them to be there. We've invited them to be here um, to perform services for us. Similarly, contractors and vendors, we've invited them to be here to perform services. They're not employees. Maybe they're independent contractors, but still they're doing something that we think is useful. Uh, but it's even broader than these categories because maybe you have a hotel um, and people just sometimes come in asking for directions or asking to want to use the telephone or asking to want to use the bathroom. Um, those people are invitees because you're a place of public accommodation. Your doors are open to the public. And until you tell people, nope, you aren't welcome here. And again, we want to be careful because we don't want to discriminate based upon race or religion or gender or national origin. So if we start turning people down of a particular group, um, we open ourselves up to um, legal action. Uh, but anyway, you can see the world of invitees is pretty big and they are entitled to these types of protections from us. Okay, so now we're up to our last topic. We've talked about non-guests, and now we're gonna talk about how we remove a guest who we don't want here anymore. Obviously, this is not something we want to have happen. It's not a, a good situation. We're not happy, they're not happy, nobody's happy about it, and hopefully it doesn't come up often, but there are times where we need to say, this is not working out. We don't need you to be, we need you to not be here anymore. And here are some, some reasons that that can come up, that that can be an issue. One, of course, is lack of payment. The person um, has stayed and, and incurred expenses. Maybe it's uh, food, maybe it's uh, a bar tab, maybe it's a hotel or other services, and now they aren't able to pay. Um, you can certainly, under those circumstances, uh, insist that somebody leaves. Um, if you are trying to remove someone from their hotel room, it's best to not use force uh, to get the police involved so that they can assist in the removal of that person who is expressing a reluctance to leave on his or her own. Sometimes in the circumstance, particularly of hotel rooms, you may want to have some kind of security that this person will in fact be able to pay. For example, you may want a credit card uh, so that if the person um, runs out on the bill, you're going to be able to be covered. Um, that's fine to do, but you have to make sure that you do it for everyone. So for example, if it looks like you only do it with people of this particular race or this particular ethnicity, um, then that could be, again, a problem from a legal standpoint. So it's best to either require everybody to give that credit card or don't require it from anybody. We've already discussed the issue of transient guests versus tenants. We already talked before about how it's easier to remove a transient guest who isn't in a position to pay than a tenant. The tenant rules about eviction are going to kick in, and it's going to give that person a great deal more protection than that transient guest. So again, that analysis we did earlier on about those factors that can uh, affect whether somebody is deemed a transient guest or a, a tenant become uh, more and more important. <coughs> so one category again is, is the uh, lack of payment. Let's go on and talk about inappropriate conduct. Uh, this is especially important, um, uh, many times this comes up perhaps in a bar setting where somebody is loud. 
um, they are acting inappropriately to guests or to employees, um, profanity, threats, um, uh, uh, inappropriate sexual comments, things along those lines. Um, naturally, you're loath to have a somebody who's paying a tab, uh, paying his bill, uh, to asking him or her to leave, but if he or she is running out, running other customers off, or is putting employees in an awkward situation, then you do need to ask them to leave. Um, this can be an issue when the guest is sexually harassing or harassing in another way an employee, maybe making racially offensive comments. Uh, the employer does have a duty to um, uh, put the employee in a safe situation where he or she won't be subject to harassment. And sometimes that can require um, uh, confronting the, the guest, asking him or her to stop the behavior, or if they are unwilling or unable to stop the behavior, um, excusing them from the facility. We'll talk about overstays in a second. Let's go on and talk about kind of the ultimate unfortunate situation, and that is when you have a guest that has been involved in an accident of some type or has become ill or possibly has died. Um, it can be uh, through an accident, through natural causes, or perhaps even through suicide. Uh, we talked in a previous chapter about the importance of having an emergency plan to, to handle these situations, to have it be as detailed as possible, to uh, practice the policies and the practices and, and responsibilities, and to make sure that your employees are familiar with it. Um, in the crisis situation, it's easy for people to forget what they're supposed to do if they haven't practiced it before. Um, so you want to make sure that you, you follow those plans when these issues arise. Um, some things you want to think about is you always want to make sure that you are providing the appropriate medical care that's, that's needed in that situation. Um, you obviously aren't a doctor or nurse, so you're relying upon experts to uh, make, make the right calls under those circumstances. That's got to be the first priority, um, preserving life, preserving health under those circumstances. Um, you also want to do it in a respectful manner. Um, life and preservation of life is the first priority, but you also want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that is, is uh, uh, respectful of the person, respectful of that person's family. For example, um, if a person has been injured and, and it's necessary to remove clothing, you'd want to not let uh, onlookers gawk at the person in, a, in an unclothed manner. Um, if, um, a, or, or, just, or even if they're clothed, you don't want to have a bunch of onlookers looking at medical procedures being performed. Um, if somebody has passed away, you'll want to treat that person's um, body in a, in a respectful way, um, whether or not the family is present at the time, but certainly if the family is present at the time. And you'll also want to, um, uh, more onerous than um, uh, we ordinarily have um, in the scenario of, uh, here we go, Okay, um, sorry about that. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here with our connection. Um, so that so again, eviction is the term when the landlord wants to remove somebody. Typically, it's for non-payment, but it could also be because they're damaging um, the facility or things along those lines. And and again, the, the the requirements for eviction are significantly more onerous on the landlord than they would be when you're dealing with a transient guest. So let's say that you've removed somebody and maybe for non-payment and or maybe they've damaged the facility and you want to collect. Uh, one path to consider is a small claims court claim. A small claims court obviously is a court that's designed to hear small lawsuits um, involving typically $10,000, maybe $15,000 or less. Um, in many jurisdictions, businesses can uh, represent themselves in those cases and don't need to hire an attorney. In Texas, if the business is a corporation, they, the business would need to hire an attorney to represent itself. Um, so it's not as inexpensive as it could be. Obviously, if you're going to hire an attorney, unless you have attorneys on staff, uh, you're looking at spending uh, several uh, thousands of dollars, most likely, or at least several hundreds of dollars at an absolute minimum, and so you'd want to have a claim that was several thousands of dollars. If the person uh, uh, 
walked out on a you know four hundred dollar hotel bill it's not going to make sense for you to hire an attorney obviously to resolve that issue as you move to different locations different states you may find that the rules are different also if the business isn't a corporation you'd want to look in to see whether this particular business style that you have this entity that you have whether it is legally required to hire an attorney before it can sue or be sued in small claims court Um, let's, so here we go. So we've talked, now we, now let's talk a little bit about overstays, which is our slide 25. So what is an overstay? An overstay is a guest who refuses to vacate his or her room. So we're talking about a, a hotel guest when he or she has exceeded the number of days originally agreed on at the check-in. Again, we look to the registration card to see how long the person is scheduled to stay. So we want to make sure that that card is completed and that it is accurate and unambiguous with respect to that. Now, when somebody overstays their, their, what their registration card provides. In many cases, the hotel is delighted. That room was gonna be vacant otherwise, and so now the hotel gets another uh, day's worth of, of uh, pay for that room, and so it's a good piece of information. But it might be that the hotel has been dissatisfied with this guest stay. Perhaps they have been difficult, noisy, uh, destroyed stuff in the hotel or things along those lines or perhaps um, the the hotel room has already been booked by somebody who is entitled to the hotel room and so there can be circumstances under which the hotel needs that room or, or needs that transient guest to be gone and so under those circumstances the hotel is going to try to uh, remove that guest um, uh, because of the overstay and again, you'd want to make sure that you're following the procedures that are appropriate. Um, may well need to get law enforcement involved if the guest continues to decline to leave. Well, this concludes our presentation covering um, Chapter 10 of our uh, textbook. I hope that this has been helpful for you. As always, if you have questions or concerns, please uh, feel free to contact me. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm going to end the